Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and um, welcome to the sixth and last lecture in our series on the origins of art. Um, thanks for coming again tonight, and a special thanks to all of you who stayed with us during the whole series and um, attended the full uh, series um, and all the different topics that we covered in the course. Today, our journey through prehistory is coming to an end, um, and I think it's only suitable that on this occasion we're also jumping forward in time again into the Neolithic regions where already Maria Guanin um, led us to a few weeks ago. Um, we have, as you will remember, covered now a number of factors, the influence of cognitive development, of climate change, of personal uh, adoration, different factors uh, that conditioned and allowed for the origins of art or the development of art more broadly. One thing, however, was conspicuously absent from our discussion so far, and these are depictions of human beings proper. Um, we have seen a very few figurines in the lecture by Jill Cook, but generally our um, account of human artistic activity um, did without any visible traces of how, what humans looked like or how they represented themselves. This last gap is going to be filled tonight by today's speaker, Ludwig Morenz. Um, Ludwig is an Egyptologist by training, so we are also uh, profiting tonight from someone with a different set of expertise who is not as many of our other speakers are looking forward in time, but actually looking backward. So goes to earlier periods, to the Neolithic, and what he's normally working on. Ludwig Morenz studied Near Eastern archaeology and Egyptology at the German universities of Halle and Leipzig, where he also completed his PhD. After that, he taught at the University of Tübingen and had a number of fellowships at prestigious institutions such as the IFK in Vienna and the Forschungsbibliothek Gotha. Since 2009, he is chair for Egyptology at the University of Bonn in Germany. Um, to say that Ludwig is a productive scholar is definitely um, yeah, it's, it's incredible. I think since we invited him, which was about a year ago, he has published, I think, no less than three new monographs. I think a new one is also in press, so it's absolutely staggering to see uh, what he has produced uh, over the course of his career. Topics range from a short archaeology of Egyptian humor to visual poetry and in ancient Egypt. But he is especially one of the leading experts in... Um, the field of the development of writing in Egypt. So the becoming of the hieroglyphics and where the boundaries between these signs of writing and image making do lie. His really um, classical study by now, Bildbuchstaben und symbolische Zeichen, so image letters and symbolic signs in German, is uh, probably one of the most influential work on this theme in recent years and also highly pertinent, I think, for art historians. So, uh, really excellent, magnificent treatment of these border lines between what images and what signs and letters, words, writing, writing an image, where the border lines might lie. Um, what makes his work so pertinent for our series is especially that he is one of the very few archaeologists who do have a sustained interest in the work of our institute's founder, Abby Warburg. Um, using his concepts, his idea of Denkraum, Think Space, and his interpretation of primitive science as apotropaic means um, in a productive way, often for the decipherment of sign language in Neolithic science of Anatolia, a topic that he will be also touching on tonight. Um, his most, that's, it's most evident in, his, in one of his most recent books, the Evolution of Media and the Creation of a New Think Space, 2014, a really fascinating attempt to decipher um, the representation of signs on a group of monuments in Neolithic Anatolia. Um, today, his talk will discuss material from the same regions. His paper is, as you would have guessed it, 
um, part of a new book project, which is, I think, once again already in press. So um, you can't invite this man and basically get unpublished research because he's far too quick in putting it out to the public. But uh, we're nevertheless very happy to profit from your insight into the early phases and the earliest representations of men in Neolithic Anatolia. Ludwig, uh, we're looking forward to your paper. And have to open your PowerPoint. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, thank you very much for coming after a long uh, uh, university life. And uh, yeah, now I'm going to speak about faces and conception of faces. Uh, and on the one hand, uh, we uh, may consider them as given anthropological universals. On the other hand, various features are highly determined by various cultures, uh, cultural factors and often individually shaped. In an aesthetic perspective, we can pr speak probably just from the Egyptian Old Kingdom onwards of specific portraits especially concerning the so-called reserve hats and examples such as the bust of Prince Anchaf dating to the first half of the third millennium. This observation, however, does not exclude the possibility that formerly schematic representations from a Paleolithic or Neolithic <laughs> periods do not refer to specific individuals. We may even assume that a generic representation of humans might not have been of interest at all. But to answer such questions, our data might not be sufficient. At least in the case of the uh, specifically over-modulated Neolithic sculpts from Jericho and other Levantine places, the interest in a particular individual is rather obvious. The face can be understood as an elementary sign as well as a dynamic semiotic complex encoding meaning in and with human communication. As we all know, the face is naturally given as well as culturally constructed. Furthermore, the natural face itself was culturally shaped and we know practices such as painting, tattooing and so on from early times of human history onwards. In his book Faces, published in 2013, Hans Belting raised the question how far we should understand the human face as an image, and that anthropological question depends heavily on individual as well as cultural context. Following Belting, we can understand a mask as an external face, and a face as an internal mask. Concerning the face, an elementary aspect of image making was the overcoming of death by cultural efforts. In retrospect, uh, in that respect, images contained inherent tensions such as presence versus absence, being alive versus being dead, and so on. Asking questions about identity we may look at a face in three different layers of meaning, idea, representation, and substitute. In terms of evolutionary anthropology, we can understand the face as a typical issue of primates, and concerning the complex process of socialization, recognizing faces and reading expressions was an, a very important factor. The face constitute a core of communication and the ability to communicate in various ways. Following Konrad Lorenz, uh, one key stimulus in human behavior is the baby schema, an extremely reduced and simple schema of the human face. We know such simple schemas from Paleolithic and Neolithic representations of faces and masks as shown in the early Neolithic miniature mask from Anatolian Nevali Chori. In these images, as well as in the famous 
baby schema, the eyes as well as the mouth appear especially significant. To understand an image properly, one needs to know a lot about cultural context as well as the period I, a hermeneutic concept developed by Baxendale many years ago and probably while he was already director here at Warburg Institute. Archaeologically, we can trace a specific interest in the human face and head deep into prehistory. One of the earliest examples is a skull from Kebara cave in present-day Israel, dating to around 60,000 before present. It was intentionally taken from the body, and that practice already indicates a specific interest in the human head. From the European Paleolithic and Mesolithic, we may call to mind various archaeological traces of so-called skull cults. One of the oldest, if not the oldest, known depiction of a human being is known from an ivory plaque dating to the Oring Nassian. It measures 3.8 centimeters in height. On one side, this Paleolithic plaque shows a human figure, or if we look more closely, possibly a stylized human figure in a, a jamming jack schema with the head of an animal or wearing a mask. This is not entirely certain because state of preservation is not so good. The other side of the plaque shows three rows of ten lines each. The figure is a concise image formula of the human body with a human head and especially the face constituting an important part. In comparison, we may add here the famous hybrid creature of a lion man from Hohenstein-Stade and its relative from the Swabian Alps. These hybrids unite two different concepts. Animal plus human being resulting in a supernatural creature. In retrospect, this was a big cognitive leap, which happened probably more than 30,000 years ago with the beginning of physically uh, uh, modern human. The two sides of a Paleolithic plaque from Geisenklösterle uh, wonderfully illustrates the hypothesis of the art historic and anthropological thinking of Ebi Warburg, the meeting and melting of sign and image in the horizon of Verbindung von Mathematik und Götzendienst. It adds some 10,000 of years to the horizon of Warburg's examples usually taken from classical antiquity or Renaissance. Some of the famous so-called Paleolithic Venus figurines show a remarkable lack of face. The oldest of these faceless figurines was found in the cave Hohlefels, once again in Swabian Alps, in the oldest layers of the Oring Nassian. Thus it was created in the period of the anatomically modern man while the Venus of Willendorf is millennia younger. This is something we tend to forget when looking at this um, Paleolithic uh, material that uh, some of the very similar objects we, we tend to compare are uh, thousands of years away from uh, each other. To understand this iconographic feature, we should know more about social practices these figures were used in, but uh, so far there is little more than to, to offer than informed guesses. Neither beauty nor art provide sufficient categories to understand these female Paleolithic figurines without face. A more general uh, reference to fertility seems a reasonable assumption. The intentional lack of face seems to refer not to a specific individual, but to, to, to a distinctly female prototype of fertility. Um, you may see here that um, sort of even with the Venus of Willendorf, the hair is, go, is kind of covering the face. Um, uh, 
what I didn't show in examples here are these female figurines with faces. So we may probably uh, uh, <coughs> distinguish uh, uh, faceless female figurines from female figurines with faces, and I'm not sure uh, sort of um, about sort of uh, of differences. But uh, looking at this all Ignatian statue, it seems quite clear that. Uh, uh, it would have been possible to module a face, but that for some, what I would, I would argue that uh, uh, there was a specific interest of not showing the face, and this is, I think, very interesting. This absence is, I think, significant. To understand the Gesichtsfragen, once again, a term I find quite difficult to translate. In the sense of Hans Belting, we can look first at the dichotomy between a kind of cubist formalization versus a more naturalistic representation of the human body in the early Neolithic uh, statuary topic. I'm uh, sort of, which should be the uh, main um, course of, of this lecture. A comparison shows the difference. One of the heads uh, is sh shown very cubist as just a block without details, while the other style shows a much more realistic schema face. Let me briefly go back to the other one. It's quite important because uh, these figures are not so easy to, uh, these pillars are not easy to recognize as a schematized representation of a human body, but if you look here, it's quite clear this is an arm. And uh, we know various examples uh, from this pillar where the hands are shown as well. So this is the body and this is the head. And uh, sort of, uh, this is probably also something for, for discussion uh, uh, and uh, of interest uh, for art historians that we have here this kind of very early cubist representation of, uh, of a uh, human body and uh, in particular the human face. I mean to, to see that as a human face sort of requires uh, sort of some uh, um, uh, thinking or, or, or some um, uh, goes first against expectation and it's only understandable in uh, analyzing the whole complex of, of this uh, uh, language of art, whatever art is. The pillar humans from Göbekli Tepe seem to represent supernatural beings, probably gods. So the other type, as represented by the Urfa man, this, this red figure here, might be another kind of more realistically human-shaped supernatural being. So this is also quite important for understanding sort of history of religion, because very often there is a discussion, when can we start speaking about personalized gods? And uh, Göbekli Tepe seems to be one of the very early examples where I think it's, it's very likely that these monumental uh, pillar figurines, uh, some of them more than five meters in height, do represent not only supernatural beings, this is a more neutral term, but possibly also gods, especially since they have here these small signs which uh, uh, gives them a specific identity, in this case probably the identity of a moon god, because here we see the crescent as well as the moon disk. Um, standing in between statuary and the natural human body, there are the overmodulated skulls we know from Near Eastern <coughs> archaeology. So far we know examples from various places in the Levant. This cultural technique is known just for the age of a pre-pottery Neolithic B period, starting in the 8th millennium. Oops, sorry. Um, <coughs> and it seems to have been used 
in just one specific area sharing some cultural specifics. One of the overmodulated uh, skulls found in the excavation directed by Kenyon in Jericho is shown in a special exhibition in the BM. You may have seen. <coughs> This exhibition brings together scientific analysis and cultural interpretation. <coughs> to complete these overmodulated skulls, inlays had been used especially to represent the eyes. As in the example from Jericho, shells had been used. This seems to be a reasonable aesthetic solution, but one might wonder about symbolic significance too. We know the practice of inlays to represent eyes also from early Neolithic statues, statuary such as the discussed men from Urfa. Here yeah, it's quite clear that it all, uh, inlays are not well preserved, but there are traces of, of inlaid eyes as well. Scientific analysis may rediscover fragments of biographies uh, for these heads. Thus we learn the skull from Jericho to be one of a man more than 40 years old. Above the eye, we can detect an injury which probably caused his death or was post-mortal. So this difference would be quite significant for understanding the meaning of this particular skull. And this is sort of from, from a perspective of science not easy to solve. We may wonder how this fact relates to the special treatment of the skull. Archaeological context seems to be quite significant because that skull was found under a wall and we might speculate about a specific ritual. Some of these overmodulated skulls were found not individual but together. This raises the question of secondary burials, very much discussed in archaeology and very difficult to solve. Mapping the early Neolithic skulls and masks produces an interesting result, which is shown by the following map of Stodeur and Chavan. The tradition of overmodulating <coughs> skulls appears in the pre pottery Neolithic <coughs> B in the Levant, and especially in an area reaching from Aswad in the north to Jericho in the south. On the other hand, we can observe a certain continuity in space and time. Thus, in central Anatolian Kösköik, skulls were also modulated with a specific substance and from Chatalhüyük, levels 8 to 5, we know graves without skulls as well as overmodulated skulls. The archaeological data can be combined with depictions of headless humans combined with vultures on the uh, walls of houses of Anatolian Chatalhüyük. Furthermore, we can observe a long chain of tradition with examples such as the early sculptures from Nevalichori, such as a so-called totem pool depicting vultures above humans. Here we can expect a certain intertextuality. From other cultures, we know the practice of decapitation after death, such as the special treatment of skulls by the nomads of Middle Asia. Do these similarities in practice refer to similar meaning or even an old anthropological substratum, something I always find hard to believe in, but on the other hand, one shouldn't exclude that option. <coughs> Methodologically, the issue is not easy to solve, but at least we should consider the possibility. The major motivation for overmodulated over skulls in Levantine pre PNB was probably the replacement of perishable flesh by unperishable material. It implied a restoration of the body which looks alive even if it is manifestly dead. This interpretation offers a reasonable explanation for our archaeological data. More confirmation is hard to get from an area of pre-writing. Furthermore, we can observe a complex effort in shaping the face of the dead in Levantine PPNB. It generated an aesthetic and semiotic trinity of overmodulated skull, 
mask and figurative sculpture of the dead. And this cultural practice is extremely interesting for understanding the anthropology of the image. Dating to PPMC, we know from Jordanian Ein Hassal anthropomorphic statues as well as masks, but no overmoduled skulls. Problem here for interpretation is that, uh, as far as I know, there is no archaeological um, find place where we have all three examples represented. <coughs> In some examples, we have sometimes we have mask and skull. Sometimes we have skull and figure, sometimes mask and figure, sometimes only a mask or so, but uh, this is all from one particular area from the Levant. So um, uh, I think this kind of uh, semiotic trinity uh, is uh, probably uh, coherent and uh, uh, what we shouldn't forget is these uh, are possible sort of accidents of fragmentary <coughs> transmission. I mean, if we, had, uh, uh, we are dealing with a period uh, uh, 8,000 years ago, it's probably not so much a surprise that we do not find a complete picture. But uh, this is uh, once again <coughs> difficult to check and we have to uh, uh, use uh, to, to, to work with uh, specific assumptions. How does this bundle of archaeological evidence for the anthropology of the image correspond to the burial practice in the Near East? In addition to Jericho and Chatal Hülk, we have particularly good archaeological sources for Anatolian Chayuni. Here a decapitated corpse and a skull, as well as a knife, were found together. Furthermore, we have evidence for a communal burial practice in PPNB Chayuni. In a later phase, we find specifically arranged skulls showing traces of intentional cuts. The situation in PPNB Nevalichori, House 21, might be comparable because here a skull was found with a Silex decor close by. My colleague and friend Klaus Schmidt interpreted this archaeological situation as traces of a ritual of decapitation of a dead body. Pillar being 43 from Göbekli Tepe shows a rather complex pictorial narrative. We cannot delve into detail here, but we should cons uh, concentrate in the headless man embedded in the scene. So he is depicted here. And here's the enlargement. In the lower part of the image, we may notice some particularities concerning size. Thus, in relation to the human figure, the scorpion is not calibrated, but shown fairly big. So it seems not unreasonable to assume a symbolic significance, and we can speculate the scorpion having some specific mythological significance. In many, sculpture, uh, in many cultures, scorpions were associated with a sea of life and death, and fertility as well. We shouldn't exclude the possibility of a certain polysemy, or to quote another um, uh, a person associated with uh, Warburg Institute, Henry Frankfurt, who often uh, spoke about multiplicity of approaches. The cultural background of the pictorial narrative of Pillar being 43 might be a kind of shamanistic narrative dealing with life and death. Within this context, the headless man might have had specific symbolic significance. This headless human figure shows three distinct iconographic features. First, the obvious headlessness. Second, the erected penis. And thirdly, the raised arms. Due to the fragmentary preservation, we cannot be sure whether the whole body was shown or only part of it. The large bird to the left of this figure would cause some problems when reconstructing a full human body. While in the facial part of this pillar being, 
um, a mythologized form of the course of the sun is depicted. Yeah, here's the sun, and here's probably kind of mythological narrative, which I promised not to discuss too closely here. Um, uh, in the lower part of the depiction, a journey through the neverworld or underworld uh, seems likely. Within this framework, snake and fox act as guarding figures, while the scorpion might refer either to the sea of death or fertility or overcoming and overcoming death. The combination of a motif's headless human figure and large bird can be combined with depictions of headless humans with vultures known from the wall paintings in Neolithic houses from Chateauhuyuk, which I did show earlier. Furthermore, it is interesting to note that vultures clearly show the shape of not bird knees, but of human knees. Going back here, a bird's knee would, uh, would, be, would go just the other way around than the human knee. So, so, um, so they can in, be, probably be interpreted as hybrids, and we may think once more of some kind of shamanistic background. From the proto-dynastic period in the Nile Valley, we can compare the pictorial motif of a headless human person shown on a kind of stick from Gebelein. I have to apologize. I did a drawing of it, and I forgot to put it in the PowerPoint. I hope it's at least partly recognizable. Here you see the raised arms. Here again. Here's the body, and here it's clearly headless. Uh, it shows a large bird and a rather small and headless human figure with raised arms. The setting of this particular scene is in front of uh, a, a sacred building, which continues here. Between these objects uh, and images from Göbekli Tepe, Jatal Hülk, and Gebelein, there is a difference of millennia and some thousands of miles. Taking these enormous differences in time and space into consideration, we may nevertheless think of a potential cultural drift from Upper Mesopotamia into the Nile Valley, but this requires far more research. For the headless human figure from Pillar being 33 in Göbekli Tepe, we may compare from the sculpture in the round, from Göbekli Tepe, the protome of the head, down to phallus, in which the additional part of the body was not depicted. This figure was probably no architectural element, and we can understand it uh, as a kind of herme, you know, from classical antiquity, or probably part of a composite figure, which is more unlikely. Since archaeology does not provide any clue for the primary functional context, we can just speculate. In its pictorial form, rather extreme, is the face follows from Neolithic Nemric. There is a certain openness in interpreting the rather distinct pictorial form, but the sacral context seems likely. The partial figure of a man on pillar 43 from Göbekli Tepe stresses the potency and fertility of a headless man, most likely the dead. A possible biological background for this motive is provided by a biological phenomenon, the erection of penis after death. If humans in the period of mourning observed such a, such a strange phenomenon, it seems reasonable, uh, a reasonable interpretation to understand it as a symbol of overcoming death and uh, to uh, hope for res recreation. This biological phenomenon might be the natural core of the idea of, Egyptologically speaking, proto-Osiris, and we can assume that it was symbolically and mythologically interpreted as early as the early Neolithic period in Upper Mesopotamia. And uh, to that idea, we might relate other uh, figures from the Nile Valley as well as the Levant. In monumental form, we may add the colossal figure of the god Min from Koptos, 
they are, uh, none of them is completely preserved. We know three large parts of statues. Uh, um, one in the Eschmolian Museum, no, two, two in the Eschmolian and one in Cairo Museum. Um, and they are particularly similar to the so-called Urfamen, this figure from the 8th millennium. To distinguish, um, while the mean colossal statues are shown holding the uh, phallus, we may think especially of an apotropaic gesture. To distinguish between apotropaic gesture and symbol of fertility, we need additional information for the context. The inscription on the side of each mean statue refers to an expedition uh, from Koptos to Wadi Hamamat, and therefore a protective gesture seems more likely. So this is in inscription is, is here on that side, where the finger is pointing to. Ten years ago, our Polish colleagues working in Tel El Farche, um, in the delta of the Nile, found two remarkable golden men. These golden statues from the fourth millennium, now in Cairo Museum, may represent the idea of fertility and resurrection, and we can understand this as a kind of proto-Osiris. And once again, the face is extremely <coughs> highlighted. This motif of fertility overcoming death and resurrection was specifically thematized in the Egyptian myth of Osiris, but as discussed, it <coughs> might have neolithic roots. This assumption would explain depictions such as the headless man with raised arms uh, from Göbekli Tepe as well. <coughs> Reaching from the overmoduled Neolithic skulls, skulls to masks and statues in the Levant to our 21st century with uh, uh, aspects such as plastic surgeries as shown in the American television series I Want a Famous Face from 2004. Hans Belting discussed questions of identity and authenticity as well as manipulation and differences of faces in the dichotomy of presence versus absence. Looking from the perspective of Gesicht and Zeitalter seiner technischen Reproduzierbarkeit and various options to correct nature sheds new light on the old human problem of authenticity of faces and images of persons. How authentic can a representation of a dead human being showing them alive be? Which structure, structural status does absent presence or present absence and images have? That seems to me a crucial problem of an anthropology of images. Having this perspective in mind, we can now look at the so-called oldest portrait from Africa. The oldest anthropomorphic plastic from the Nile Valley was found in the Neolithic settlement of Merinde Beni Salame in Western Delta. Archaeologically, it can be dated to the fifth millennium. His head is made of clay. Below there is a hole, and thus the head could be fixed on the staff. Particularly noteworthy are the small holes in the zones of the hair and the beard. Here and here. Here either natural or artificial hair could be fixed, and that was a specific artificial strategy of authentication. In addition to the image, uh, the hair generates a specific reality effect. Even if we lack additional context information, we can assume a sacral dimension and place this head in the world of the sacré. To express sacrality was probably a moving factor for shaping this head and the special strategy of authentication with embedded hair. The possible meaning ranges from an image of a god to an image of an ancestor, and we could also not exclude the possibility of being it a kind of puppet representing a dead person. Here the inherent concept of similarity is intriguing. 
another kind of similarity seems uh, relevant for a pre-Egyptian type of object trouvé or ready-made. In the fourth millennium, a stone just shaped by nature was probably seen as a representation of a human figure and therefore it was deposited in an Akata tomb in the necropolis of Abu Sir el Melek. For understanding the stone as a figure, it was sufficient to see a similarity on metaphorical level. Thus, it has some structural similarities to the concept of hobby horse and Gombrich discussed many years ago. The face is just a flat surface, but this might have been significant in itself. A few centuries older is a head of a stone found in the Artaza, now in Cairo Museum. Here, a naturally given shape of a human face was artificially reworked by adding the holes for the eyes. The two holes representing the eyes provide a special facial expression. Once again, we lack specific information on the context. We can think of a kind we can think of a usage as a kind of mask for the dead, and we may compare the much older masks from Anatolian Nevali Chori. So this is my point to, uh, to conclude, and uh, sort of uh, uh, best thing would be if uh, we could enter into discussion if you want to, and uh, thank you very much.